Um, as many of you know, Paul Merriman is a nationally recognized authority on mutual funds, index investing, and asset allocation. Many of you are familiar with his books, podcasts, and of course, his regular column in the Wall Street Journal's Market Watch. And in retirement, Paul has dedicated his life to giving everyone the financial education tools too often reserved for those who are wealthy. We are lucky he calls Bainbridge Island home, and we're thrilled that he's been partnering with us on this financial education series since 2016. Paul, um, thank you. And please go ahead and introduce our distinguished speaker, Christine thank Benz. You. Thank you so much, Bridget. Well, there are times in life when it's not what you know, but who you know. And I am thrilled uh, and, and have always enjoyed uh, knowing Christine Benz and the work she does is so respected. Uh, she is the, uh, the director of personal finance and retirement planning at Morningstar. She is on a number of the lists of top influential finance, women in, in the financial industry. She is also, as of December, the new president of the John C. Bogle Center for Financial Literacy. And uh, what a wonderful person uh, to have uh, uh, carrying on uh, the tradition of education uh, that, that uh, the Bogle found. Uh, the Bogle uh, Financial Literacy Center, uh, they couldn't have a better person. So, Christine, thank you for joining us. As I told people last week, you were going to make a different presentation. We were going to have a different format. And then I saw you as one of the, uh, uh, of the keynote speakers at the White Coat Investors Conference in Arizona, and I just was blown away by the presentation and I, and I, my age, I don't run very often, but I ran up afterwards and I said, could you please do that presentation for the Bainbridge folks? And so that is what she's going to do tonight. And welcome, welcome to Bainbridge and welcome to another part of the world of investing, Christine. And I'm, I'm going to plant myself in the back here and uh, be watching the Q&A. Uh, and the only time that I'll interrupt is if you say something or somebody says they don't understand, I, I might just bust in there and mention. I know how you, you want them to understand the presentation. It's all right. yours, Christine. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Paul. I appreciate the invitation. I wish I were physically there in Bainbridge. I do love the Pacific Northwest and have loved the time that I've been able to spend in uh, the Seattle area and Olympic National Park and um the whole vicinity is just absolutely lovely and would love to be there in person with you. In reality, I'm in uh, my home in the Chicago suburbs. My company, Morningstar, is based in Chicago. Um, Paul, I just wanted to thank you for the work that you're doing in financial education. Like you, I feel passionately that uh, good financial information should not be reserved for the very wealthy. And I also just firmly believe that our financial health has such a link with our physical health, our emotional health, and what we're able to achieve in this world. So like you, I am a, an evangelist for helping people improve their financial lives. And I just appreciate that you're putting on this series. Um, this particular session that I'll be talking about tonight is geared toward people who are thinking about retirement or all already in retirement. And it'll focus specifically on the issue of figuring out how much you can safely spend in your retirement, which is kind of a complicated problem, it turns out. So I'm just gonna go ahead and share my presentation here with all of you. And uh, let's see, we'll start at the beginning. Um, and I'll talk about, I'm not going to spend any time on this. This is just my company and what we have to offer. But the main thing I would say here is that we have a lot of great information for individual investors and a lot of it is free. So if you come on Morningstar.com, all of the articles I write about retirement planning, all of the model portfolios that I work on, it's all part of our free service. So Morningstar.com is a good resource 
if you're researching investments or kind of figuring out your plan, or maybe you're working with a financial advisor and you want to backstop the recommendations that he or she is, is recommending to you, Morningstar is a good resource for you. And I would also say there's a, a library version that many libraries subscribe to um, that includes all of the ratings on uh, mutual funds and exchange traded funds and individual stocks, the key difference versus the product that we actually sell to people is that you wouldn't be able to save your specific information, but otherwise a lot of the functionality is there. So ask your, your public library if they're a subscriber to Morningstar. In terms of the roadmap for what I'll cover tonight, I'll just go over that real quickly. Um, I'll start by talking about why this issue of figuring out how much you can safely spend in, in retirement is such a nettlesome one. It's arguably the hardest problem in all of personal financial planning. And I'll talk about why that is. But I'll then get into some specific conclusions that we can take away from the research that we've done at Morningstar, as well as some other retirement researchers have done on this topic of safe withdrawal rates. So a few of the key lessons are that the starting market conditions, the stock valuations, stock prices matter a lot. The level of interest rates and yields that are on offer matter a lot. And there's kind of a good news story in there for people who are just embarking on retirement today. So beginning conditions matter a lot. The complexion of your portfolio, your your combination of stocks and bonds and, and safer assets like cash assets, that matters a lot too. And, and balance is really important. Um, I'll talk about inflation, which is newly top of mind for many of us as, as we've seen an increase in inflation over the past couple of years. I'll talk about how to think about that and how to make sure that your plan your withdrawal plan and the rest of your financial plan for retirement has at least some insulation against high inflation. And I'll just talk about how retirees' own spending is apt to be variable over their time horizon, that uh, retirement spending isn't sort of a, a straight line throughout retirement. We actually see that retirees spend more in line with what's been called the retirement spending smile. And I'll share kind of what that looks like and what the implications are for your retirement planning. And finally, I'll talk about the value of being at least somewhat flexible, if you can, in terms of how much you spend from your portfolio per year. That if you have some leeway in your budget to take less in a down year like 2022, that redounds to the benefit of, of your plan and that redounds to the sustainability of your plan. So let's just dive right in and start by talking about why this safe spending amount problem is such a hard one. Um, this slide depicts what would have been a safe starting withdrawal percentage for retirees with various portfolio mixes at various points in market history. So the top line is a portfolio that would have 75% in stocks, 25% in bonds, so a fairly stock heavy portfolio. That's the dark green line. And you can see that over many market environments that more stock heavy portfolio did support higher withdrawal rates. And I'll just describe what we're looking at here. Each point on each of these graphs represents what would have been a safe starting withdrawal percentage if you had uh, embarked on withdrawal in a given year. So for example, let's look at that high point um, in sort of the late 1940s. You can see that if you had an all equity portfolio or 75% equity portfolio and you were embarking on retirement then, well, that would have been a great time to retire with an equity heavy portfolio. You can see that we got over 10%. So your starting withdrawal could have been 10%. And then you would just inflation adjust that dollar amount, your initial 10%, the dollar amount you didn't you'd inflation adjust thereafter. So that would have been one of the better periods to retire into that uh, ended up being 
a period where we saw great market returns, stock market returns in the 1950s and uh, for part of the 1960s at least. So that was a, a great time for people to retire into. You can see other time periods, it really didn't matter what you had in your portfolio that you would have to settle for a lower safe starting withdrawal amount if you wanted your portfolio to last over a 30 year horizon. So let's focus on that period in sort of the late 1960s, early 1970s for an example of when would have been a poor time to retire. If you embarked on retirement then and you wanted your portfolio to last over a 30 year period, you'd have to settle for roughly 4%. And this is where many of you might have heard of the 4% guideline for retirement spending. This is where it came from, where retirement researcher William Bengen said, well, I wanna help pe people figure out how much they could have safely taken out from their portfolio, even if they retired into the worst market environment in history. And his research centered on that very period where if you retired in the late 1960s, you were hit with a negative confluence of events that included a bad equity market in 1973, 1974, rising interest rates and very high inflation for part of the 1970s on into the early 1980s. And um, almost everything that could have gone wrong for retirees in that specific period did. So 4% was about as much as you could have taken initially if you wanted your portfolio to last over a 30-year horizon. So that's where we got the 4% guideline that most people, if they kind of look upon this problem, they say, well, I'd rather be safe than sorry. I'd rather take out too little than risk taking out too much and potentially running out of money over, over my time horizon. I just want to... Um, do a little bit of clarification. When we're talking about spending rates, we are often using kind of a convention where we're assuming that someone wants to spend kind of a fixed real withdrawal amount over a 30 year horizon or a 25 year horizon. So if I'm saying I could take out, if, if I'm saying I could use a 4% withdrawal rate, that means that if I have a $1 million portfolio, I could take $40,000 of that portfolio in year one. And then I'm just going to inflation adjust that $40,000 amount to help keep pace with inflation as the years go by. So if inflation in year two of my retirement is 3%, or if it was 3% in year one, then my second year withdrawal could be $41,200. So I'm just taking 3% of my initial 40,000 and giving myself a little bit of a raise to keep pace with inflation. So that's kind of a, a convention in the space when we talk about safe withdrawal rates. We're assuming that people want more or less a fixed paycheck in retirement, similar to what they had when they were working. They don't want to be buffeted around too much by what's going on in their portfolio. On the other hand, some retirees might say, I'm more comfortable with making those adjustments. I can, I could take more like a, a 4% year in and year out, but we'll talk about some of those flexible strategies later on. When we're talking about safe withdrawal rates, we're generally assuming that that pattern that I talked about where you're taking X percent in year one and then inflation adjusting that dollar amount thereafter. So we don't know how the market will perform over our time horizon. That's what the previous slide illustrated. We also don't know how inflation will be over our specific in retirement time horizon. So this slide just depicts the rate of inflation over the past uh, several decades. And you can see that it's bounced around a lot. And I think this recent example, the recent bout of inflation is a great illustration of just how difficult inflation is to predict. Because I think in the decade leading up to say 2021, many of us had kind of gotten complacent about whether inflation would ever be a big deal again. We had been in this sort of uh, 2%, maybe 3% range for inflation for a good decade prior to this recent bout of inflation. And, and it was very difficult, and indeed impossible to predict the catalysts 
for this recent bout of inflation where we had a global pandemic, which snarled up supply chains. And then we had all this pent up demand coming out of the pandemic where people had savings built up and felt that they wanted to spend the funds that they had managed to save. So this is just a long way of saying that inflation is incredibly difficult to predict. And so it's difficult to know how that should factor in to your spending plan. And it obviously makes a big difference. Are you assuming a 3% inflation rate over your retirement time horizon, or are you assuming something more like 5%? Um, if you're assuming something more like 5%, you'd obviously want to be conservative in terms of that starting amount, because you'll know that you'll be inflation adjusting by those larger amounts as the years go by. So another factor that's super difficult to figure out and another reason why figuring out a safe starting withdrawal rate is so difficult. Another issue in the mix is that we tend to not be great judges of when, when we'll actually retire. And I love this slide because it um, looks at a population of individuals who are asked prior to their own retirements when they thought they would retire. And then it monitored those same individuals and followed up with them and looked at when they actually did retire. And what you can see is that there's kind of a disconnect. So to focus on that 50 to 59 cohort in the pre-retirement zone, 6% um, said that they thought they would be retiring that young. Whereas in reality, 29% of those same people retired in that age band. Similarly, many people thought that they would work longer than they actually did. So to focus on that 70 to 79 age cohort, pre-retirement, 15% of people, and that's represented by that bright blue bar, 15% of the people surveyed said, I think I'll, I'll retire somewhere in that zone of, in my 70s, between age 70 and 79. But in reality, uh, just about half of those same folks were able to delay retirement that long. And so this is just to say that we, as much as we, we like to think we have control over our retirement dates, there are a lot of things that can get in the way and disrupt our anticipated retirement dates. So it might be our own health, it might be a spouse's health, it might be a parent's health. It might be that we do a job that's physically taxing that we're unable to do for the long haul. Or we know that ageism is an issue in our culture and that you may be forced out of the workforce longer than you would consider ideal. There are just a lot of things that can force our hand with respect to our specific retirement date. So I always get nervous when I hear people say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm planning to retire in June of 2031 or whatever it might be. Well, I hope so. And, um, you know, it would be great if that plan works out and you're happy with that. But there may be reasons that uh, that doesn't work out or you may simply choose that you don't want to continue to do that job. So we tend not to be great judges of when we, we, we retire. And obviously, when we retire and how long we anticipate our in retirement time horizon to be is a swing factor. If we are forced to retire earlier than we expected, if we retire in our 50s, for example, we need to plan for a longer time horizon than would be the case for the 70-year-old who retires at that life stage. So just another wild card in this um, difficult problem of forecasting safe withdrawal rates. So the wild cards are starting to stack up. We talked about the uncertainty of stock and bond returns and how influential they are in determining what's a safe withdrawal rate. Can't predict inflation with any degree of accuracy. Can't even predict our own retirement date. Another factor in the mix is that we don't know exactly how our own spending might go. And specifically, a real wild card for a lot of us is just long-term care expenses, especially if we don't have any sort of long-term care insurance. And it's debatable about who needs long-term care insurance. But if we don't have it as part of our plan, that could be a variable that forces very high spending later in life, typically. So we don't know our own spending pattern. And then the elephant in the room is that we don't know our own life expectancy. So it's very difficult to plan for spending over a horizon that's uncertain. 
if you were able to look into the future and had some sense of how long you might live, that would give you uh, a little more peace of mind in setting your withdrawal rate. So now that I've scared everyone to death about why this is such a difficult problem, we'll talk about some of the conclusions that we can take away from the research on what is a safe withdrawal rate. So um, this is a slide that uh, points to the value of starting market conditions when you retire. So on the left-hand side of the screen, I'll just describe what we're looking at. We're assuming someone had a $500,000 portfolio in the early 1970s, and that portfolio had a 50% bond, 50% stock uh, mix. And that person who embarked on retirement at that point was using a 5% withdrawal rate. Well, we saw in that earlier slide that that was kind of a bad period to have retired into, right? I mentioned that the stock market returns were bad, interest rates went up, which hurt bond prices, inflation went up. So a person who was spending 5% initially on that 50% stock, 50% bond portfolio would have been out of funds over a 20 year horizon. So by the early 1990s, he or she would have spent through that whole portfolio. So that's a failure, right? Because typically if, if, if you're embarking on retirement, you wanna think about planning for a 25 or 30 year horizon. And of course it depends on when you retire. If you're someone who's retiring at 75, you probably don't need to plan for such a long horizon. But if you're retiring at kind of a conventional retirement date in your mid sixties, and have reasonably good health, you would want to think about planning for a 25 or 30 year time horizon. So on the left-hand side, we see a retirement failure. The person was taking a too rich withdrawal rate during that specific time horizon because so many things worked against him or her. On the right-hand side, it's just what if we flipped the sequence of returns and the early, the great returns that occurred in the early 1990s and in the second half of the 1980s, what if those happened early on in the time horizon? So same 50% stock, 50% bond portfolio, same 5% withdrawal rate. This slide illustrates that such an individual would not only have been able to meet his or her income needs, but would have also been able to really grow the portfolio. So they didn't run out of money at all. In fact, they actually increased the portfolio balance. And then the bad returns of the early 70s occurred at the tail end of the time horizon. And that mattered a lot, a lot less because that individual had made it through the woods, had made it through the tricky part uh, of the early years of retirement with good market returns and then encountered bad market returns at the tail end. So this Chris, is just um, an illustration that it's kind of luck of the draw, but starting market conditions matter a lot. Yes, Paul? Christine, this is Bridget. Yes. Um, someone was asking if you can enlarge the slides a small amount. Enlarge yeah, the slides see. a little bit. Yeah. I'm not sure if I can. Um, that might be something that individuals can do on their own screens, but I'm not sure I'm able to do that in this view, in the slideshow view. I think I'm kind of stuck with this. Uh, uh, you know, all you have to do, I think, is go up and hit that uh, little round green uh, up in the upper left-hand corner of your computer, and uh, it... It, it has filled by doing that. It has enlarged it and filled my whole screen. So okay. that would be something they could try. Okay. I think individuals might be able to do that on their own screens. And that would probably be the easiest way because I think I'm kind of stuck with what slideshow is giving me here. Um, the other thing I would say is my email address is at the end of the presentation. And so if you would like a PDF of the presentation, I'd be happy to send it to you if that would be helpful. So um, just in terms of what we're just talking about, so starting uh, market conditions matter a lot when you're thinking about your own retirement. This slide just gets back to that bad period in the uh, late 1960s, early 1970s, there were a lot of things that were worrisome for people embarking on retirement at that point. 
Um, I, the ideal conditions for starting your withdrawals would be stocks are cheap. And that's a little counterintuitive, but it's better to retire into an environment after stocks have sold off a little bit. Um, so, for example, the retirees who retired into 2009, for example, coming out of the global financial crisis had cheap equity valuations. So that that's, would be an ideal market condition. You'd also want to have higher yields available to you rather than the very low yields that were on offer a couple of years ago, because very low yields tend to portend not such great returns from uh, fixed income assets, bond assets, and cash assets. And then you'd also want to see low inflation lining up in your favor. If you saw all of those things together, that would be an omen that uh, the the market returns would probably be at least halfway decent over your retirement time horizon or over the early years of, of your retirement time horizon. On the flip side, those things, if, if those things were inverted, that would certainly be, be a negative. So if you have very high stock prices or very low bond yields or very high inflation, any combination of those things would be kind of a bad environment to retire into. So how does how do we think about today's environment for people who are thinking about retirement or perhaps have already embarked on retirement? Well, there are a couple of um, positive things to talk about, even though 2022 was a, not a great market environment, um, certainly for stock or bond investors, we saw almost everything lose money in um, kind of conventional portfolios. But the silver lining is that that sets us up for somewhat better things going forward. So this is just a snapshot of our um, price to fair value graph that we have on Morningstar.com. This is part of our free site. And um, it's a look at what our analysts think about the companies in their coverage universe. So if they think that a company is perfectly fairly valued, it would have a price to fair value of 1.0. If uh, they think a company is undervalued, it would have uh, a price to fair value of less than 1.0. And if it's overvalued, it would be higher than 1.0. And so we can roll these all up, looking at all of the price to fair values for all of the companies in our coverage universe in an effort to get around, get our arms around whether the market is cheap or expensive. Well, the good news is, is that thanks to 2022 and the fact that it depressed stock prices, well, that tends to improve our forward-looking outlook for how stocks might behave. And we've already seen stocks recover a little bit so far this year, but um, at least coming into this year, our analysts thought that stocks were relatively inexpensive, especially non-US stocks. I know many investors have kind of have kind of given up faith in non-US stocks, but um, when we look at our global coverage universe, we we see that uh, generally speaking, the non-U.S. component of our coverage universe is trading a little less expensively than the U.S. component. Um, this is just a view of our Morningstar style box, which is uh, meant to be a depiction of all of the companies in our coverage universe arrayed from large on the top horizontal band to small companies on the bottom band, and then in terms of investment style from left to right. So on the left-hand side would what would be what we would consider value-oriented companies. Um, I know Paul is a big fan of small company value, small cap value, or the, the small company value stocks. Um, but these are, are companies that generally are trading at a discount to the broad market. They often have dividend yields that are higher than the broad markets. Um, on the right-hand side would be what we would consider growth-oriented companies. So these would be a lot of the technology high flyers uh, would be in the growth column of the style box. So this is a view of the price to fair values for various components of our Morningstar style box for companies that we have under coverage. And you can see it's fairly evenly dispersed. The point of this slide is that 
yes, the um, small cap value box appears to be the cheapest part of the style box. And this was as of the end of 2022. Um, and uh, other parts of the market aren't quite as cheap, but generally speaking, this suggests that our analysts think that the, the market is fairly cheap overall. It's not just concentrated in a single square of the style box, the under level of undervaluation. This is a look at uh, both North American and non-North American stocks. So non-US stocks are depicted on this slide. Again, this would be the price to fair values for um, various regions throughout the world. And one takeaway here is that other parts of the world actually look a little bit cheaper to our analyst team than do uh, North American stocks and especially US stocks today. So if you haven't revisited your portfolio's non-US exposure, this is a, a call to maybe consider that, consider adding a good total market index fund or um, some broad-based non-US exposure to your portfolio. So equity valuations are looking a little better to us. Um, bond yields are also lending a helping hand for a change. So we can see looking at um, bonds across different issuing countries, you can see that yields have trended up in part because uh, central governments have been trying to tamp down inflation. So you can see that even Japan there at the bottom um, with very low yields for many years, sort of 0% yields, even Japan lifted interest rates, the Bank of Japan um, in the in, in early uh, uh, 2023. So um, this is good news for bond investors because there tends to be a tight correlation between starting yields, starting interest rates, and what you're apt to earn as a bond investor over, say, a 10-year horizon. So this is a good news story for bond investors. It was a painful dislocation. If you had bonds in your portfolio last year, you felt the pain. Um, but the good news is that higher yields set us up for better returns from fixed income assets and cash investments certainly have better yields today than they did a couple of years ago. So starting to be kind of a good news story, right? That we have uh, lower equity valuations, which predict tends to predict better equity market returns. And we also have higher fixed income yields, which are correlated with um, better bond market returns. The uh, I meant I've referenced our our Morningstar team's outlook. This is a kind of another lens. This is uh, capital markets forecasts, asset class return forecasts from various firms for the next decade. And you can hop on various investment providers' websites. Many of them are making these available. And some of you might say, well, you know, forecasts aren't worth anything. And I think you'd be right, especially if you're talking about very short term forecasts. If someone's saying that they know what the market will return over the next year, that's very, very difficult to predict. But um, I think you can use these forecasts to help think about kind of your long term planning needs. And we do see that they tend to ebb and flow with what's going on with equity valuations, with stock market valuations, as well as what's going on with bond yields. So you can see that um, for many of these firms, they are predicting better things from um, non-US equities so that the developed markets equities, as well as emerging markets equities, that uh, they're predicting better returns than they are for U.S. stocks over the next decade. And then you can see there's a tighter convergence among various investment providers when it comes to fixed income return expectations over the next decade, in part because starting yields are such a good predictor of what we bond investors will earn. So, um, this is just kind of additional food for thought as you're thinking about your planning. But generally speaking, this is a much more positive story than if I had shown you this slide a year ago when we had still pretty high stock market prices and bond yields were still pretty low because the Fed, the Federal Reserve hadn't yet embarked on its campaign to lift interest rates in an effort to 
uh, stamp out inflation. So um, kind of a better news story in terms of forward looking market prospects, which is a good news story when you're thinking about what is a safe withdrawal rate. So um, this is reflected in some research that my team at Morningstar has done on the topic of what's a safe withdrawal rate. So when we did um, research at the end of 2021, where we used kind of uh, 20, 2020 equity market valuations and bond returns, we came out with a 3.3% safe initial withdrawal rate. So that would mean that if you had, again, a million dollar portfolio, that you could take out 33,000 of that portfolio and then inflation adjusts that 33,000 thereafter. So a pretty low number. In fact, lower than the 4% um, guideline that you may have heard of. When we revisited the research in incorporating better market prospects, we lifted that number a little bit. So we came up with a 3.8% uh, expected uh, safe withdrawal rate over a 30 year time horizon. So we used um, inputs in terms of market returns from our uh, colleagues in Morningstar Investment Management to help inform what would be a safe withdrawal rate. So definitely a better number than was the case in late 2021 because we had better return prospects that we, we were putting into our, um, into our Monte Carlo simulations that led to our safe spending rates. So um, inflation is a somewhat different story. We used a, a 2.8% inflation rate in the 2022 research, whereas in the 2020 research, we had used a 2.2% inflation rate. So inflation, the inflation assumption went up a little bit, but still the starting safe withdrawal rate was at least a bit closer to the 4% guideline. So um, the assumptions that we used in, in terms of coming up with that 3.8% safe withdrawal rate is um, the, some of the, the conventions that I talked about before, where we're taking 3.8% of the portfolio in year one and then we're inflation adjusting it thereafter. We're also assuming a balanced portfolio of stocks and bonds. And we're assuming that someone wants a 90% success rate. So they want a 90% chance of not running out of um, funds during their retirement. And here you might say, well, wait a sec. I want 100% uh, success rate. I want 100% odds of not running out of funds over my time horizon. And the reason I would say that it's, that's probably too aggressive in terms of success rate is that even though we're saying that you should start with say 3.8% initially, that doesn't mean that you can't go in and potentially revisit that um, portfolio withdrawal rate as the years go by. So for example, if market returns are really poor in the next couple of years, you would probably quite naturally rein in your spending a little, at least a little bit. And that would in turn improve your success rate from there. So um, if you were anchoring on a 100% success rate, the net effect of that is that you would have to start lower than the 3.8% that I'm talking about here. And it's also assuming that you're never going to look back or never make any changes. And in reality, most people are willing to do a little bit of a course correction if need be. So um, the takeaway that I would reinforce from that previous set of slides is that beginning market conditions matter a lot. The beginning stock and bond market return expectations matter a lot. And the good news story is that things seem to be getting better in part because yields are going up and in part because stock prices sunk a bit last year and that sets us up for better return prospects going forward. The second lesson from some of the research on safe withdrawal rates is just that um, the composition of your portfolio matters a lot. So if, for example, you wanted to go with a really safe portfolio, and few investors do do this, but if you wanted to just not even really invest your money at all and just keep it under the mattress, well, you can see that you would have to, if, if, if we're looking back over market history, you would have had to settle for a very low 
initial withdrawal rate. But um, you can see that over uh, various time horizons in history, 100% uh, stock portfolio has actually supply has actually provided the highest starting safe withdrawal amount. So if you hit it exactly right, um, you could have taken a six and a half percent starting withdrawal amount. But the interesting thing is that the balanced portfolios, so the ones that included 75% stocks and 25% bonds or 50-50, um, those tended to offer kind of a happy medium. So the lowest safe withdrawal rate was neither uh, terribly low, unlike the 100% equity portfolio, nor was it um, the highest. So it tends to just offer the, the sort of happiest medium, medium as you're thinking about safe withdrawal rates. So this is looking back over market history about what would have been supported over various 30 year time horizons from 1930 through 1990. So I think the takeaway from this is that balance is, is really valuable rather than having a too safe portfolio or one that is too stock heavy. And this one may be super hard to see. So I'll just describe what we're looking at here. This is looking at um, the uh, our, our most recent research, looking at um, our recommendations. And I, I mentioned that um, we converged around this idea of, of 3.8 percent starting safe withdrawal percentage. That's under the 30-year column. So we're assuming a 30-year spending horizon. So someone is going to be retired for 30 years. And you can see when you look at the various stock weightings, you can see that the highest withdrawal rate, those 3.8 percent withdrawal rates, are coming from the portfolios that range from 60 percent stock to 30% stock. So the balanced stock allocations are even a little more conservative than balanced, tended to support the highest withdrawal rate. Um, if you have an even shorter time horizon, so maybe you're an older retiree, maybe you've been retired a good 10 or 15 years, you can see that um, the withdrawal amounts that would be supported are quite intuitively higher. And the more conservative portfolio mixes actually led to the highest starting safe withdrawal amounts. So looking over it under that 15 year column, for example, you can see that 6.7% uh, starting safe withdrawal amount would have been supported or would be supported by portfolios with uh, stock allocations as low as 40%. So between 40 and 20% you could use a starting safe withdrawal amount of 6.7%. If you had a more equity portfolio and you just have a 15 year time horizon, you're not really getting paid to take that equity risk. You have to settle for a lower safe starting withdrawal amount. And the reason is that stock returns, even though historically we know they've been higher than the returns on safe assets, they're just much more variable. And that is especially true if you shrink the time horizon. So if you're looking at time horizons of, say, 10 years, well, stocks are just extraordinarily volatile and unreliable. It's not to say that you wouldn't want to have some stocks in your portfolio over, over, over a short time horizon, but you'd want to have safer assets in your portfolio as well. Um, and this slide just illustrates how the variability comes into play and how it interacts with the expected returns. So the, these are the expected return inputs that we used for our research. So we're assuming a 30 year time horizon and you can see that indeed the stock returns are much better than the bond returns, but they're also much more volatile. And that's what we're seeing in that far right-hand column. We can see the standard deviation, the volatility of those stock market returns. We have to assume much more variability and much more volatility in those stock market returns. And that's why when we put this all into our simulations, into we run what are called Monte Carlo simulations to come up with these starting safe withdrawal percentages. You can see that's why our model gravitates toward the balanced portfolios. It says, nope, the equity returns are just too unpredictable that we need to have 
balance in the portfolio to provide you with something that you could draw upon without having to touch the depreciated stocks. If stocks happen to tank right out of the gate early on in your retirement, you need to have some safer assets that you could spend through. And that's kind of the logic behind holding safer assets in the portfolio alongside the higher growth assets in the portfolio. So um, this is just a slide that illustrates something that I often talk about in my work, which is the bucket approach to retirement portfolio planning. And it sort of uses that same logic that I was just talking about, where you're essentially using your portfolio spending to inform how much you invest in each asset class. So um, the first bucket is holding maybe my first two years worth of portfolio withdrawals. So if I'm taking out 3.8% of one, my $1 million portfolio, it's uh, holding about 76,000, like two years worth of portfolio withdrawals. Um, if I'm setting up a bucket two, well, this is kind of a high quality fixed income portfolio. And it's accounting for maybe another five to eight years worth of anticipated portfolio withdrawals. And with these two components of the portfolio, the bucket one and bucket two, I've essentially built myself a runway so that if stocks fall in early on in my retirement and they stay down, well, this gives me a runway of investments that I could effectively spend through without having to touch the stock piece of my portfolio. So bucket three is the stock component of the portfolio. For young retirees, people just embarking on retirement, this will house the bulk of their research, of their assets. For older retirees who have shorter time horizons, they might have a bit less in that bucket number three. And I'll just um, share what this might look like with actual portfolio holdings. This um, here we're, we're assuming a $60,000 initial expenditure on a one and a half million dollar portfolio. So we've got two years worth of those portfolio withdrawals just in cash investments. We're not taking any investment risk with this component of the portfolio. We are subjecting ourselves to a little bit of inflation risk, but we're not taking any investment risk. With the bucket two, this is housing another eight years worth of those portfolio withdrawals. So we're just multiplying our $60,000 portfolio uh, withdrawal by eight to come out, come up with 480,000 in this portion of the portfolio. So you can see with this bucket one and bucket two, we have 10 years worth of our portfolio needs. And then bucket three is the growth engine of our portfolio. But the nice thing about it is that we don't have to touch it if we don't need to, that we have basically 10 years worth of spending in safer assets, uh, which means that we don't have to touch equity assets if we don't need to. So that would give us um, some leeway to run through if, if we have, for example, another lost decade in stocks, like we had in the period from 2000 through, through 2010, stocks were essentially a flat line over that period. If we had another period like that, having a runway like this uh, means that you would never have to touch those depreciated stock assets during that period. So um, the net effect of this exercise, I think it's kind of helpful from a mental accounting standpoint, but the net effect of this for many of us, if we kind of run through this um, scenario planning where we're thinking about our portfolio spending and let, letting that drive how much we hold in each of these asset classes, the net effect is that many of us will end up with kind of a balanced portfolio as we move into retirement. But it's something to run through, even if you're using some other method to set your portfolio's mix of stock and bonds, to kind of think about your starting withdrawals and use that to inform how you position your portfolio across various asset classes. Um, a key thing to know, as much as I like this bucket system, that bucket one, especially that cash bucket, does have an opportunity cost, especially with the headwind of inflation as high as it has been recently. So you wanna be careful not to overdo 
the safe assets as much as it can feel comforting to have safe as, safe assets set aside. Um, it's it's important to not overdo the safe assets um, because of the opportunity cost. So um, you could potentially use other buffer assets. You might use uh, what's called a, a standby reverse mortgage, where you could potentially tap your home equity in a pinch if you're um, if you had spent through your cash bucket and still needed additional reserves and didn't want to touch the long-term piece of your portfolio. You can use short-term annuities to fill this role. You could potentially use life insurance cash value. So if you have some sort of a whole life insurance policy or a permanent life insurance policy, you typically would have cash value built up in the policy that you may be able to tap. So there are ways to potentially skinny down the amount of the portfolio that you would have allocated to safe assets. And that's especially important for people with tighter plans where there's some concern that you might outlive your assets. You might want to think about some of these additional sources of cash versus having the dedicated allocation to cash sitting in your savings account or sitting in your, in your money market fund in your brokerage account. Um, I want to talk a little bit about inflation. So we talked about the value of minding your asset allocation. Balance is super important. We talked about the importance of kind of putting your finger up and saying, well, what are starting market conditions? If things look ominous, I'd want to be a little bit more conservative. If stocks have sold off a lot, that probably portends well for my in retirement time horizon. You also want to think about inflation. And I just pulled this quote from Wade Fowle. Wade is one of the leading lights in the retirement research space. And uh, my colleague, Jeff Patak, and I do a podcast and we talked to Wade about inflation and talked about the issue of when inflation hits in your retirement, how that might be important. So if you have inflation occurring early on in your retirement, as Wade kind of makes the point in this quote, if it occurs early on, it just kind of, even though, even if, even if the rate of inflation goes back to a more normal level, your spending may stay a bit elevated throughout your retirement time horizon. And I think the current period is a good example of that, where even though we see signs that inflation is settling down, right now, which is a, a fabulous thing, it's a good bet that spending for all of us will stay a little bit elevated, that uh, our grocery bills and perhaps our gas bills and, and other expenses, hotel prices are apt to stay, they're probably not going back to pre-pandemic levels is, is what I'm saying. And so that tends to be a headwind as you're kind of thinking about retirement spending, you're thinking that um, your own spending may in fact be a little bit elevated throughout your retirement time horizon. So inflation is definitely a force to be reckoned with and definitely something to be thinking about as you are planning your retirement spending plan. Um, I'll just talk about why inflation is such a negative for retirement planning and retirees specifically, I talked about why um, if it occurs early on in retirement, that can be such a negative. But another issue is that the categories that retirees spend on are historically, have historically been inflating a little higher than the, a little faster than the general inflation rate. So healthcare expenses in particular have seen a higher inflation rate than the general inflation rate. That's a headwind for older adults who tend to see a bigger share of their budgets go to healthcare spending than is the case for the general population. On the other hand, older adults do win on other, other parts of the ledger, specifically um, fuel costs, gas costs, are less impactful for retirees because transport expenses are typically a smaller share of retiree budgets. But healthcare expenses are a big headwind. And um, that's one reason why I think it's important to factor in inflation when you're thinking about your retirement spending plan. 
Another reason inflation is such a big consideration in retirement is that you're not getting an inflation adjustment in your paycheck automatically in the way that you were when you were working. So workers, especially in the service sector, so hotel workers, restaurant workers, have seen fairly decent wage increases over the past couple of years, which have helped them keep whole with inflation. On the other hand, the portion of your portfolio that you're pulling from to spend during retirement is not automatically receiving that inflation adjustment. If you're getting Social Security, well, yes, you have gotten a nice bump up to keep with keep pace with inflation, but you're not um, getting that adjustment automatically at the portfolio level. So you need to be thoughtful about that. Think about what's in your portfolio um, and make sure that you're embedding some insulation against inflation. And here it's important to note that inflation is the natural enemy of anything that has a fixed payout attached to it. So I was mentioning why it's um, perilous to be too safe with your portfolio, why you wouldn't want to just retire with an all CD portfolio, for example, because inflation is just, even though yields are better, inflation is just going to eat away at at any purchasing power that you have with the interest that you're earning on your on your CDs. Um, the same is true with, with bonds of any kind where you're earning a fixed interest rate. Well, inflation just diminishes the purchasing power of, of any interest that you're able to earn, which is a good reason that balance is important even as it's important to have fixed rate investments in your portfolio. You wouldn't want to have all fixed rate investments in your portfolio. You'd need a lot of wealth to help overcome the hot headwind of higher inflation. So these are just a couple of reasons why Older adults, as they think about their plans, need to bear in mind the impact of inflation. So how do we protect our plan against inflation? It's not an easy problem to solve, but as we're thinking about portfolios, it's helpful to think about including some investments that help protect against inflation. So if you have bonds in your portfolio, it's valuable to think about what are called I-bonds, which are bonds issued by the treasury that give you a little bit of nut, a little bit of nudge up to help make you whole with respect to inflation. So I bonds are one investment type to consider. Another investment type would be what are called treasury inflation protected securities. They're kind of cousins of I bonds that similarly give you a, a fixed rate of interest as well as an inflation adjustment to help you keep up with inflation. So you'd want to think about having them in your toolkit or in your investment portfolio, and then also stocks as a component of your portfolio. So stocks are no, by no means any sort of direct hedge against inflation. So if inflation goes up as it did last year, stocks will not go up a commensurate amount in that same year. But when we look at stock returns over longer periods of time, what we see is that stocks tend to out earn the inflation rate. They tend to outperform the inflation rate. So that's why even older adults, people who have been retired for many years, I like the idea of them still including at least a component of stocks to help them keep pace with inflation. So you're thinking about those two assets kind of at the plan level or at the portfolio level. And then as you're thinking about your total plan, a couple of things to consider would be um, uh, delaying Social Security. If, if you are delaying Social Security, it's important to note that you pick up a nice increase for every year that you're able to delay past your full retirement age up until age 70. I'm sure you've heard everyone talk about this issue. And, and Mary Beth Franklin, I'm happy to see, is going to be speaking to you next week about Social Security, but she'll talk about the value of delaying. But one neat thing about delaying is that even if you delay, you still pick up any inflation adjustments that occur um, during those years when you delayed. So it's not like you're foregoing the great inflation increase that people who are already getting uh, Social Security last year received. If you happen to delay uh, 
during that during that period, you'll pick up those inflation increases when you eventually claim. Um, and then it's important to factor inflation into your portfolio spending plan. As I mentioned earlier, if we're worried about inflation over our retirement time horizon, we probably want to be a little bit more conservative with our initial withdrawals, knowing that we may have to be more aggressive in terms of increasing our withdrawals as the years go by just to maintain our standard of living if inflation is really high during the drawdown period. Um, I want to touch a little bit on the pattern of retiree spending, the trajectory of retiree spending. Um, this is a slide that uh, my former colleague David Blanchett put together. David is another uh, fabulous retirement researcher, and he looked at retiree spending over the life cycle. He looked at data that monitored the same individuals over their retirement time horizons. And he noted what is depicted on this slide, which has been called the retirement spending smile. And what that means is that spending is often higher in the early years of retirement in kind of those pent up demand, go, go years. And then the spending tends to trend down in the middle to later years of retirement. And then it often trends up again later in life in part because of uninsured long-term care expenses and higher healthcare outlays overall, but especially long-term care expenses. And this probably syncs up with older adults who you've had contact with over your own lives or maybe your own retirement experience um, where older adults tend to spend a bit less in, in that period of sort of the um, late 80s or late 70s to early 80s period, and then they may spend more later in life. So this has implications for how we think about retirement spending. I had mentioned earlier that there's kind of this convention in the retirement research that people want more or less a fixed paycheck throughout their retirement time horizon. Well, this suggests that spending really isn't fixed at all, that spending actually bounces around quite a bit, um, that uh, our specific factors related to our own lifestyles affect how we might spend. We also might just have lumpier outlays in our spending that you might have years where you've got to buy a car or replace your roof or whatever the case may be, those things might drive your spending up significantly in those years, and you'll have to kind of course correct and spend less in future years. So this is just a slide to say that retiree spending tends not to be a straight line. The net effect of this spending smile, and especially that dip in the middle years of retirement, means that when we look at retiree spending in aggregate, the typical retiree spends less than the inflation rate over his or her time horizon. So the um, retiree doesn't take the full inflation adjustment as the years go by. So we modeled that into our research, into our most recent research, where we actually looked at, well, what if the retiree over the time horizon didn't take the full inflation adjustment? What we found is that that um, allowed for a higher initial spending rate than would have been the case if we just assumed that the retiree year in and year out kept pace with inflation and uh, made sure that his or her portfolio withdrawal kept pace with inflation. So that's kind of a good news story for retirees who want to maximize consumption in those early years of retirement. If you're comfortable with that trade-off, if you're comfortable with the idea that your spending may trend down later in retirement, that argues that you could take more earlier in retirement. So this next slide, and I'm going through this information pretty quickly here because I want to leave time for questions, but this next slide um, on the far right assumes that a retiree is taking a certain percentage initially from the portfolio, but not taking the full inflation amount thereafter. What you can see is that that supports a much higher withdrawal rate than was that 3.8% 3 safe withdrawal rate over a 30-year time horizon that I talked about earlier. In this case, it's a 4.3% 
starting withdrawal amount. But again, you just have to be comfortable with this idea that you won't be able to take that full inflation adjustment as the years go by. You'll have to make do on a little less than the full inflation amount. So it may be a trade-off worth pondering, especially if you're looking at that initial withdrawal amount that I talked about being safe, like a 3.8% withdrawal amount. And you're saying, well, that's uncomfortably low relative to what I'd like to take from my spending. You may want to explore something along these lines if you're okay with the trade-off in play that you may have to, that you will have to take a bit less than the inflation rate as the years go by. So um, the last thing I want to talk about is just the value of being somewhat flexible in terms of your withdrawals. So a lot of the research that's been done on withdrawal rates looks at sort of this convention where we're assuming fixed real spending over the whole time horizon, year in and year out, you're just taking that inflation adjustment in your paycheck and more or less simulating the paycheck that you had in your work while you're working. Well, one good news story I would say from a lot of the research is that if you're willing to be a little bit variable in terms of those paydays, that can redound to the benefit of higher starting withdrawals and also higher lifetime withdrawals. Um, so if you're willing specifically to take a bit less in a down market, that means that you can potentially take more when the market's good and you can potentially take more over your uh, whole retirement time horizon. So in our research, we explored a whole bunch of different variations on these flexible withdrawal strategies. Some of them are very simple tweaks. So one that we explored is what if we just assumed that in the year after a retiree's portfolio had had a loss, like a year like 2022, when most portfolios had at least some losses, what if after a year like that, a retiree simply didn't take the inflation adjustment? So if our year one withdrawal was 40,000 on, on the $1 million portfolio. And in year two, we just have to take 40,000 again. We're not giving ourselves any, any sort of inflation adjustment. Well, in a year like 2023, that might be kind of a bitter pill because we have had fairly high inflation. But what we found is that even a simple tweak like that really gives you a nice lift to your starting safe withdrawal rate. So if you're willing to explore a few of these variable strategies that can give you a higher safe withdrawal amount and can give you a higher lifetime withdrawal amount. So that's just a simple tweak that we explored. Um, another strategy would be what's called the guardrail strategy. This one's a little bit more complicated because it involves taking less in down markets and more in up markets. But it's a nice strategy. It's one that actually supported the highest starting safe withdrawal amount in our research and the highest lifetime withdrawal amount in our research. So um, we've been writing about these issues on Morningstar.com. You can kind of see some, um, I, I think, uh, lay people type uh, articles on this topic of safe withdrawal rates and how to think about some of these uh, flexible strategies. Um, this is just a depiction of how some of the trade-offs uh, are with um, some of these variable withdrawal strategies. So you can see that guardrail strategy that I referenced um, for a um, 30 year horizon supported a, a starting safe withdrawal amount of, of over 5%. Um, but the downside is that it does mean that the retiree has to put up with a little bit of volatility in his or her cash flows, that there may be years like 2022 when the retiree has to take a bit less, but in exchange in, in a period like the period that prevailed from 2019 through 2022, 21, where we had great market returns, you could take more in those years. So um, I'll just leave it there. Uh, this is just the withdrawal rate, the lifetime withdrawal rate for various um, systems, various ways of thinking about calculating your withdrawals, um, including some of the variable methods that I talked about. Um, 
one last point I wanted to make on these variable strategies is that some of them do encourage you to um, spend a bit more um, from your portfolio as the years go by. So I mentioned that the guardrails method is one that our team really likes, but it does encourage you to spend more of your portfolio. So if you're someone who really wants to have funds left over at the end of your life, a strategy like that might be a little less appropriate for you. Um, so that's just another dimension of this. And then I will just end it there. My email address is here, and I'm happy to send you the presentation if that would be helpful. I'm active on Twitter, and um, I do host a weekly podcast with my colleague, Jeff. It's called The Long View, and it's a one-hour interview with a thought leader in um, personal finance or uh, retirement planning. Paul Merriman has been our guest in the past. Next week's speaker, Mary Beth Franklin, has uh, been our guest as well. And uh, we really enjoy doing the podcast and um, would love to hear your feedback on that. So Paul, I think we have a few minutes here to take some questions. And I know, um, it, I hope it wasn't too too complicated. I know it's a lot of kind of wonky material. Um, well, but maybe that's why I questions. liked it so much, Christine. It was absolutely fantastic. And I got to tell our viewers that if they like your educational approach. I think your presentation uh, abilities are fantastic. And you have on your website, if you just, just went into to Google, did a search for Christine Benz, and then put a topic, any topic almost. Uh, this afternoon, I watched a piece that you made in 2012 on balanced funds. It was terrific. And uh, that, that and that is why you are one of the Merriman Foundation's truth tellers. We actually oh, have a thank group you. of 12 people, and, and all of them, I think, are people you would approve of that we look to to help the folks who are, are following uh, our work. So I, I, I really appreciate it. Now, we've got a problem here. we got a problem. we got about uh, over 40 questions, and we're not going to get to them in a the little I bit of time. I see that. And I'm not sure that I want them all to email you because <laughs> you don't do that all the time. I mean, the, the only person I know is Larry Swedrow, who answers every one of the emails. Oh, my gosh. He's amazing. But, but I, I'm going to, if, if, if I might, uh, have a conversation with you maybe tomorrow, briefly, just briefly, and figure out if there's some way we could to get back to these people, because here's what's going to happen. We're going to archive this, this presentation, and we're going to send it to everybody again that, that's okay. here. Tonight. And we're going to send it to the people who didn't show up tonight, because we had over 500 people who had signed up. So they're all going to get a chance to see this. And the reason we like to send that archive piece is they can forward it to other people to watch. Uh, and and I'm I'm sure that somebody's got a family member who could who could use this. We will figure out a way to include more Q and A when we send that out. Okay. Great, great. And I'm happy to send any supporting articles that would be helpful if um if if Perfect. you can share them with your with your group, Paul. That would be great. Fantastic. But let's take what we can. Okay. <laughs> it's up to fifty some. Okay questions about getting the slides all they have to do is to email you sure uh, somebody wants to know about dividend stocks uh, uh are dividend stocks a good way uh, to build this equity portfolio uh and somebody else earlier asked what if i only had 10 percent in dividend stocks any comment on dividend stocks Sure. I, dividend stocks would be a fine component of a portfolio. I still would not use them to supplant. I, I showed on that earlier slide. I wouldn't use them to supplant. I'm going to stop this sharing here. Um, I wouldn't use them to supplant fixed income and cash assets uh, because uh, I, I just think they, you know, at the end of the day are stocks. And so even though um, you might like their dividends and their dividends may supply a lot of your income needs, I would still um, augment them with uh, cash and fixed income assets pers personally. Um, uh, although I know, you know, we have so many people on Morningstar.com who are just 
dividend aficionados, um, but there will be certain environments where dividend paying stocks won't perform especially well. I think back to the global financial crisis was one such environment where we saw bank stocks in particular, which has historically been among the biggest dividend payers cut their dividends uh, pretty dramatically during that period at the same price that at, at the same time that their share prices were um, decimated. So I would just not overdo dividends. I also um, really like dividend growth strategies, uh, probably a little bit more than sort of the high dividend yield strategies. And the reason that I um, am so attracted to like a Vanguard dividend growth fund, for example, would be that it is um, kind of a higher quality dividend portfolio. Um, uh, and, you know, we saw that actually last year, uh, dividend growth stocks performed really, really well during that period. Um, so I, my bias is a little bit more toward uh, dividend growth stocks, which don't necessarily have high dividends in absolute terms, but have historically grown their dividends uh, year in and year out. That's great. And here's another question about the, the historical market performance that you're looking at, where it, returns were 9 to 10 percent. Uh, what does Morningstar do about changing things? If you go through a period where the market's only making 4 to 5 percent, bonds are making 2 to 3 percent, uh, and, 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 and what does your model do to recalculate the impact on the outcome of this analysis? And do they go to the free service at Morningstar for that? Or is that under the umbrella of what people pay for? Yeah, so um, the team that puts out the capital markets forecast where they're doing kind of a forward looking view of what the stock and bond market might return. Um, for the stock market forecast, they are looking at um, dividend yields, their expectation of earnings growth, and their expectation of price earnings multiple expansion or contraction. So it's really those three inputs go into the forecast for what the stock market might return. Um, and then for bond yields, I, I mentioned a few times in the course of the presentation that the starting yield tends to be quite predictive of what uh, fixed income might return over a time period. So they update those um, return projections, I believe every quarter, and those come out in um, the uh, a product called the Morningstar Markets Observer. I believe that investors can see, and that's a, a free PDF that people can sign up for. And it's kind of a neat compendium of graphs and I believe the forward-looking return forecast is there. In terms of that price to fair value chart, um, I believe that is on Morningstar.com and I believe it's still free, still part of the free part of Morningstar.com, the price to fair Some, value chart. Somebody wanted to know how you guys make money. <laughs> well, so in terms of um, what we offer individual investors, we do have a premium service that entitles people to read all of the analyst reports. So if you are an individual stock investor, for example, or you want to see what our analysts think about various funds, those are all behind the premium wall. So we have a premium service. We also have software products, um, kind of our bread and butter would be the software products that we sell to financial advisors, and financial institutions. So um, those would be some of the key ways that we would make money. And then we also have a part of our company called Morningstar Investment Management that does 401k consulting. So, so they would put together the menus in 401k plans and they would also um, offer managed accounts for 401k plans. So lots of different ways of making money. Have you begun experimenting with the various AI tools? Uh, they use chat GPT and BARD in an attempt to assist in solving the retirement income uh, decisions, annuitization, asset mix, sequence re risk, and all the things that you've been talking about today. Have you tested it? 
We have not, um, some of my colleagues have been fiddling around with it. Um, and we have been, we've been using it um, just kind of to um, explore different things where we have our investment conference coming up in a couple of weeks at Morningstar. And we're gonna, my colleague and I are gonna be interviewing a kind of a, an economist person um, on the main stage. And we asked chat GPT to come up with a short list or come up with a list of questions. We we're just curious what uh, it might come up with. And it was surprisingly good, but we haven't yet put the withdrawal rate problem to um, AI. It's, it's definitely something worth exploring. Well, I'll tell you, we are unfortunately, according to my watch, uh, out of time. And we will figure out a way to dig uh, into some of these. Christine, thank you so much. It is Thank you so much, you Paul. Are, you're a jewel. And uh, uh, we hope you'll come back. And I am going to ask people if they would just take a second before they leave and go into that Q&A section and just make a comment about what this presentation meant to you and uh, and while you're there, you could even mention uh, what you would like us, other topics you'd like us to uh, address. And uh, Bridget, do you mind waiting, staying after to let that thing download? And we'll catch that. And Christine can go hopefully have a, a, a glass of good wine and uh, and a nice dinner. You are you are very nice to join us. Thank we'll you so much. Thanks to everyone. Uh, Thank you, Christine. See you in October. Sounds good. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, okay. Bridget. Bye bye. 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 Okay, I'm hoping that people will have uh, dropped into the into the Q and A and left us a comment. Uh, and and oh, I would. Pardon. Plenty of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's great. Good. Uh, by the way, we just completed recording a piece on distributions. Oh. That, uh, goes. It it actually in some ways, I think is a better strategy than what uh, Christine listed there. And uh, okay. I'll figure out a way to get a copy of that presentation yeah. to our folks as well. Do you know, and this is just my having not worked on a webinar before, when we download this and finish the recording, will it keep all of these questions? I believe so. Okay. I, have, I have always had somebody in control of me. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, so I am not absolutely sure. There may even be somebody. Uh, it looks like maybe it says ninety nine plus. I don't know if that means it's going to stop. Uh, well, I think as long as we keep it open, yeah. So we're getting some really nice, really nice um, comments in the Q and A. So I'll just okay. keep um, track of these. Okay. Well, that that's wonderful. And yeah, uh, thank you, Paul. You do your best and. Uh, Thanks to everybody for coming out. We really appreciate having the chance to uh, to help you create a better financial future. That's what it's all about. That's right, Paul. Thank you. All right. Good day to you all. Okay. Bye.